Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 20 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my good friend, Pervez Ahmed. To be here, Zaki, thank you. Um, looking forward to today's conversation. We have a great guest on. We, we do. We are joined this, this time by Shahid Amanala, and, and I have known Shahid in the social media sense of the word for many years now, and so I'm very excited to be actually having a face-to-face digital conversation. This is, this is sort of a reflection of how uh, social media and just media, multimedia in general has changed things, where we're actually talking in person, but not really. It's the new reality. That's right. We'll we'll work our way up to eventually, you know, like shaking hands for real. But this is the digital handshake is what we'll have to do for now. Um, but just to uh, give our audience uh, a sense of the amazing list of accomplishments that you have racked up, Shahid is CEO of Launch Posse, an entrepreneurship platform that helps people shape and launch business ideas. And uh, prior to starting Launch Posse, Shahid served as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of State in the bureaus of secretaries John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. He's worked closely with the White House and other agencies on entrepreneurships, social media policy, combating online extremism, and fostering innovation. He's also CEO of Halal Fire, a producer of online content for global Muslim communities. And in 2001, he created altmuslim.com, an online magazine with 2.5 million annual readers, which is acquired by Pathios in 2011. In 1998, he created zabiha.com, earning the undying loyalty of Muslims the world over. Uh, that is the world's largest halal restaurant guide with 10 million annual users and 500,000 app downloads. Shahid is also a principal at Affinis Global. Am I saying that right? Yep. Uh, which organizes hackathons to solve global challenges and is co-founder of Affinis Labs, an incubator for startups with positive social impact in Muslim communities. All of that means uh, he has accomplished far more than I probably will in a while. So thank you so much for coming on and talking with us, Shahid. It's really a pleasure to be here. And you know, after listening to the first 19, I'm going to listen more eagerly to the number 20. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, we, we've got a lot to talk about, but I think uh, rather than bury the lead, we'll, we'll start with uh, Hackathon. Hackathon. Yes. Uh, tell us about that. This is, this is, this is a brand new <laughs> endeavor, and uh, it's gotten a lot of play in the media, and uh, we'd love to get your take on it. Well, the idea of the hackathon, and you know, for those readers that uh, you know aren't familiar, hak means truth in Arabic, and the idea of the hackathon is to bring together the talented resources we have in Muslim communities around the world, combine it with authentic Islamic scholarship, and generate solutions to global problems, not just for Muslims, but for the world. Um, I've always thought that for whatever issues the Muslim communities are going through, we have more than enough talent, resources, money, et cetera, within our communities to deal with it, but they've never been harnessed uh, in, in an innovative way. And so uh, by bringing together different partners that can, can, can support these initiatives and bringing together really innovative individuals, um, we're going to try to tackle some of these problems and come up with some really quick, innovative, and of course, social media driven solutions to some problems and we started out uh, with doing one uh, two weeks ago in Abu Dhabi, which uh, was specifically centered on addressing Muslim youth markets um, with an idea of, of taking the um, uh, mainstream moderate Islamic scholarship and translating it essentially for the Twitter generation and trying to address their, their social, spiritual, religious needs. Um, I think it was a success. I think some great things came out of it, but it was the first step in a long journey. We're planning to do hackathons around the world focusing on different problems like uh, human trafficking, women's empowerment, um, you know, whatever issue we can find, we're going to do one on climate change, for example. Um, and, and it shows, it, it does multiple things. First of all, it actually starts um, getting us out of this rut that we're in to actually start proactively solving some of these problems. Second is that the event itself serves as a notice to the rest of the world that we uh, are, are, are a source for, making the world a better place. We're not just a source of problems, as you see in, in the media. We actually have something deep in our heritage that's of value to the world, whether you're Muslim or not. And by doing this again and again and again, we really hope to drill that point in and actually make real change happen. Through just sheer force of repetition. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, now, um, no, you... I, 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 you um, talk about you know connecting with uh, a mainstream traditional Islamic scholarship and I think you can't 
get any more traditional or mainstream, what have you, than uh, being able to connect with the likes of um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya and you know Sheikh Hamza Yusuf right here uh, in North America. Um, how are you able to do that? Well, you know, the really interesting thing is that um, when we started doing these hackathons, we were doing them in other contexts, but when we did one in Abu Dhabi in December, and it caught the eye of uh, Sheikh bin Baya's organization, the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. And I don't think we ever imagined that they would see something like this as a, as a vehicle to move things forward. But um, to their credit, even though I think a lot of them still don't understand social media and they don't understand this new generation, um, they were willing to take a risk. And one of the things I told them, as I said, look, the world's largest Muslim community is not Indonesia or some other Muslim country. It's the community of Muslims that lives on the internet. That's now the world's largest ummah. And they have a language all their own, and they have a style all their own, and they have habits all their own. And if we do not tailor our messaging and our resources to them, we're going to lose them. <clears throat> they're not going to have a glue that holds them together. And so they, they were willing to take a risk on it. And they were very happy uh, from, by the results of, of our first one, and they're willing to now put in the resources to, to multiply that all over the world and, and to solve real problems. Um, which I think uh, a lot of us have been frustrated at Muslim organizations basically fighting their battles through press releases, you know, and, and nothing beyond that. Um, and, and, and I'm glad to kind of unstick that traffic jam with these. And, and, and I'm very hopeful. Wow. So, so they, so they literally like sort of you, 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 you were on their radar and they reached out to you yes. uh, when they knew of your endeavor. That's, that's, yeah. that's amazing. That's exactly. amazing. Exactly. Well, we, we, we were kind of in their backyard and so some of them were in the yeah. hackathon we did and they were, there was, I think what really caught them off guard is how much passion and energy it generates. It's really amazing. People willingly stay up all night to work on these projects and, and to generate that kind of passion around this, uh, around this, this cause I think it really surprised them. I think that's they were looking for passion, they were looking for energy, and and trying to stimulate that through traditional means is really difficult. And so um, I think it was the first time they really saw maybe there's something about this younger generation, the Gen Xs, the Millennials, whatever, that um, that we need to harness our our you know our wagon to that engine and let that pull us forward, um, which yeah. is a complete reversal from the past. Um, and it, I know it's going to be a bumpy ride. I know there's lots of things that uh, people are not going to understand. I think there's people that still think that online conversations are frivolous, uh, trendy, you know, things like that. But I am determined to prove them wrong. And I think the level of talent that's out there that's still kind of raw and undiscovered, I think when it finally comes out to light, I think it's going to make everybody proud. Yeah, I, I really appreciated the analogy, actually. I, I never, ever thought of it that way, but uh, I have to hand it to you, Shahid. The, with regards to seeing the online community as kind of the um, the most sort of populated, you know, yeah. uh, space for for the Muslim community worldwide, uh, uh, and 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 you know, I, and and I guess a part of that, um, you know, uh, to sort of continue that analogy, you know, you also tend to have some authoritarian voices in there, and you know, it's our, you know, it, there is the temptation to fall into that trap, and then you know, there's pushback. So, uh, but it's also a marketplace of ideas and a democracy of ideas. So, fascinating. Ooh. Here's the thing, right? You know, for the first time in human history, we have the ability to connect to anyone in the world, and we have the pr ability to project our story out there. Um, the only way we can fail is if we abdicate our responsibility to do that. You know, when 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 you see, for example, extremist voices online, the only reason they have more traction is because you know the million to one others that are actually the majority are not proactively putting their stories out there and drowning out those. Those, those stories which really should be marginal. So I, I want people to embrace their new role. Um, and I don't think, I, mean, I, I have this conversation with authority figures a lot. It's not something they should be afraid of. You know, we're talking about people who genuinely love their religion, who genuinely love their fellow Muslims and their fellow, their fellow human beings. And I, I firmly believe that the wisdom of the Muslim crowd online is something that everyone will be proud of and nobody should be afraid of. We just have to, we just have to, to cultivate that audience and, and let it feel its strength and its power um, and let it get out there. Um, and this is, this is how we do it. I mean, you know, there's one frustration I've had about the whole online Muslim space in the last 15 years is for the number of Muslims online, there's relatively few 
service providers online that are cultivating conversations or cultivating products for that community. Um, and I think that's a travesty. I think that there needs to be, you know, there needs to be, we need to multiply it 10 or a hundred times fold the number of podcasts, the number of websites, the number of social media initiatives. Um, it, it, it doesn't reflect the, the talent that we have out there. And that's what I'm trying to like, I'm, I'm trying to crack that nut. Well, okay. So, so you, you, you talked about the, the Muslim online space and I, I think that provides a perfect segue as any to go back in time a little bit and talk about uh, your own entree into the Muslim online space. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, about Alt Muslim, which you founded in 2002. And, uh, you, for, for a while there, you were the only game in town when it came to providing uh, a Muslim conversation online. I, I was, I'd love to hear, uh, the genesis of, of uh, that website and, and sort of what it became. Well, sure. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd always been interested in um, media projections uh, by Muslims, even, you know, in the earliest days of the Internet. I remember back in the, in the early 90s, you know, um, I was registering domain names from Muslim organizations, telling them, hey, there's this great tool called the Internet. You really need to use it to, to you know, if you re- even now, if you do a who is search on on MPAX domain, you'll find out that I registered it in 1994, right? So like, <laughs> I was, I mean, I, I really believed in this medium's ability to, to, to create something new and dynamic, but we still lived in a world where information from our communities was tightly controlled and the, con- and the conversations were, were tightly controlled as well. And, and one of the reasons that you say that, you know, in the years after 9-11, um, alt Muslim was kind of like a lone voice is because I think people still didn't, understand what their responsibility was as Muslims. Like, I think a lot of people genuinely thought, you mean I can actually go out there and speak as a Muslim, like without running it through a leader or running it through an organization? I mean, people still had that mindset. And it took a while to break it. It really did. I think obviously the first people to break that were were the younger folks that that were much more steeped on the internet. Um, but, it, but we went through a the community, you know, our communities went through huge shifts after 9-11 where we, we also realized that the, the amount of work that needed to be done in rehabilitating the Muslim image, in communicating the truth about our communities, could not be done by our organizations. They just simply didn't have the capacity, even if they had the will. And so it really left it up to, 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 to those of us on the web. And as you started seeing voices emerge on the web that were having an impact in the, in the popular discourse, I think that emboldened more bloggers and emboldened more people than obviously when social media happened, it blew it all out of the water. Everybody now has a voice. Everybody gets excited about putting it out there. And now we've, we've come so far in 15 years where, you know, the majority of conversations about Islam in the mainstream media have a Muslim at the table. And it's generally a Muslim who was trained in the social media sphere. So that's something I think we can all be proud of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I, I'm looking at you right now, Shahid, and, and, and myself as well. Our, our gray hairs, uh, I think, bespeak to the fact that we are probably both uh, children of the 80s, uh, grew up in probably 80s, 90s, uh, you know, in the Muslim community and all that was going on. I'd love to sort of go back even further, sort of, uh, you know, tell us about your own sort of background and, you know, where you grew up and, uh, you know, where your involvement with the Muslim community began and, and, and things like that. I'd love to hear that. Absolutely. You know, so I, I was born in Hollywood, California. Um, <laughs> I can see it already. Yeah. My parents intentionally went to a hospital in Hollywood so they could tell everybody that we were born in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it t- it t- by the way, the building that I was born in is currently the headquarters of the Church of Scientology. Um, oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How interesting. So you um, might say you were born into the church. I was born into the church. <laughs> um, but, but I, you know, I had the fortune. Uh, I, I really had the good fortune growing up to be introduced to and become a member of the community um, surrounding a, a certain mosque in Southern California that was led by uh, an amazing man who passed away earlier this year. Rahim Dr. Allah, Rahim. that's right. And, and, you know, growing up in his mosque, um, it was so unique because he downplayed the culture of our parents. He said, you're American. It was drilled into our heads. You're, you are American. This is where you belong. This is your homeland. You don't owe any allegiance or any, you know, you don't need, don't look overseas for your inspiration. Look here. And from day one, from when I was 12 years old, we were told, you are leaders. We're followers. You're leaders. You're the ones that have to lead us forward. And and there were many of us who, were, who came from that community that basically – 
saw leadership as a birthright, you know, mm. that, 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 that we were not going to take no for an answer, that we were going to be innovative, that we were going to do this out of a concern for our communities, do it from a, a, a sense of being positive. And, and that's what kind of, I think, gave me my foundation for when the internet happened. You know, I was also fortunate enough to be in the Bay Area. You know, I went to, uh, I, after I graduated high school, I went to UC Berkeley, um, which did, which also steeped me in the free speech movement and steeped me in the, the power of narratives to mobilize people and things like that. And then, of course, being there afterwards and being in the Bay Area when the internet happened, I just, there's a series of fortuitous, you know, circumstances that right. each of them contributed a piece um, to where I am now, which is, you know, I, I just, I, I, I believe we have incredible untapped potential. I have no desire to like, you know, own it all. I, I, for every company I launch out of my incubator, I cheer them on and I don't want anything in return. I want them to go and do good work. Um, I want, you know, I, I, I always tried with Alt Muslim to find bloggers that I thought had raw talent, bring them in, get them trained, spin them out, let them do their things. I mean, I built Alt Muslima from scratch for free because they said they wanted to continue that model um, and focus on gender issues. I don't want anything for these things. That's not, that's not why I do them. Um, I, I believe our best days are yet to come. I believe that, um, you know, my goal is to see an America where the average American is proud, happy, and safe to have a Muslim neighbor. And mm -hmm. that the only person who can judge that are those people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I believe we can work to get to make that happen. And I don't think it's far off. I think it's within my lifetime. And it may seem weird to people who are seeing protests and whatnot. But, um, you know, we, we we're still we're we're, we're like five percent of our potential. Um, and that's and that's and that's what I've kind of dedicated my life to, to seeing happen. You know, I, I didn't mean to speak over you when, when, when you mentioned the name of the community or, or the or the individual I think that you mentioned, uh, and that was Dr. Mar Hatut, mm -hmm. uh, and of course Dr. Hassan Hatut, and yes, the yes. and the community uh, of the Islamic Center of Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's fascinating, Shahid, that uh, I, I think there's so much that comes out of that community, yeah. uh, meaning so much good, right? Yeah. Because if you, I mean, you 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 can't trace the or if you go back and you trace the trajectory of organizations like MPAC uh, and, and just so many others, ISNA even arguably, right? Oh, I mean, you, 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 another you, one, right? You can't go back. You, you, you know, that, that, that all of that sort of traces back to that yeah. community. Yeah. Our, our, uh, all intertwined. Absolutely. Right. Right. I mean, oh, Salam yeah. Mariati and MPAC comes out of that organization. Yeah. Um, you know, the scholarship of, you know, Professor Khalid Abu Fadl comes out of that community yes. and, yeah. you know, it's just fascinating. And so, you know, one of the, one of the objectives that Zaki and I have, uh, you know, when we set out for this podcast was to really sort of, you know, present an oral history of or try to present or, an oral history or capture, I should say, an oral history of Islam in America. Uh, and, and, you know, and we've done that, you know, uh, by just by virtue of the, some of the guests that we've had vis-a-vis -vis the Bay Area. But I think if we were to sort of, you know, target the next community to really tell its story, uh, or to begin telling a story, and I think you would be the great, you're, you're, you're a great, per, you know, person to start with, is that community in Southern California because of the impact that it has on the national discourse. A absolutely. You know, so, so this summer, this summer, and every summer, I take my children to, um, to a Muslim youth camp in California. If you, if you go to muslimyouthcamp.org, you'll see it. Of course, the Quraysh, what, the, was it the AKA the Quraysh camp, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah, of course. It's in its 54th year. There are Muslims who are going to this camp whose grandparents went as kids. That's amazing. And, That's amazing. And, and it is a institution that in and of itself has generated generations of leaders. That's and, right. And even the DNA of that organization also feeds back to this, to this community. So it's, true. It's, you know, there are models that work. There are models that truly make Muslims feel American. And when I see communities that struggle, when I see people who are, you know, the mosque I was at had half of its board women in the 80s, you know, and like there's still mosques today that, that, that struggle to have a woman on their board. I mean, there's so much work that needs to be done. And, and part of the challenge is how do you encapsulate those values, ideas, methods, and present them and market them to other places so that these best practices propagate. Um, that's in the wake of uh, Dr. Hatut's death. Um, we were actually trying very hard to try to, how do we, 
how do we package this? How do we package this in a way that people can take from it and, and, and where they need it and improve their communities? Because it is a proven model. It is a model that has generated significant institutions and people and, and, and stable Muslim identities. And, and by the way, also Muslim identities that are proud of all of our ethnic heritages, but not tied to any one of them. Right. Right. Which is also, I think, a key in having this, these American Muslim communities move forward. Right. I mean, if I could interject, I mean, or, or just or my own sort of, I mean, obviously, I, I grew up in Texas, so, you know, uh, you know, a, a very different uh, uh, place than Southern California. But I remember as, as, uh, as a young college student, you know, and I was sort of struggling with my own issues of identity and, 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 and sort of where – you know, where I fit in, in terms of not only the Muslim community in America, but also, you know, um, uh, with regards to the, uh, I guess, you know, how does Islam speak to me and my own identity? And I remember attending a, a camp uh, as, as, as like, it was like an MSA camp, and it was at the University of Texas in Austin, which again, I know that, you know, here, here again, you, you see those sort of networks coming together, because I know you spent some time in Austin. Yep. Um, and, and Dr. Hassan Hatout was the speaker, and I remember something he said that had such a profound and indelible impact on me. And again, you know, I must have been, you know, maybe a sophomore or junior in college, uh, where oftentimes you do struggle with those issues of identity and so on. Uh, you know, he said, look, he said, he said, your home is not where your grandparents came from, but where your grandchildren will be buried. Right. And, and I mean, and that just a, a simple statement, but it's so captured it, it you know, it, it, it informed me in the sense of, look, my American and my Islam, my Muslim identities don't have to be, you know, uh, don't have to be bif bifurcated. They don't have to be at odds with one another. Well, you know, you've, you're touching on a really important point because, you know, there are many communities in America. There are ethnic communities, religious communities, and Muslim communities in America tend to tend to uh, rally around ethnicity. And the way I see it is, look, I, I'm, I'm proud of my ethnicity. I'm proud of where my parents came from. But when I look three, four, five generations from now, my ethnicity is not going to bring very much to the table. But my values, my religious values will. And so I'm putting all my chips on my religious values because my ethnicity, ethnicity what is ethnicity going to mean in 10 generations? I mean, with the mobility of people around the world, I mean, ethnicity is just going to blend and transform and, you know, American Muslim culture is going to morph. So to, 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 to hoke my, you know, to, to yoke my identity to something like that just seems very unstable. But, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to develop an identity that's based on our values, then we have to have a really vigorous conversation. What are these values? What do they mean for our existence and what do they mean for our neighbors, right? Is it, is it, is it a, are there values that are gonna isolate us from society or are there values that are going to enhance society? We, we, we still haven't had a lot of these very difficult conversations and we're at a time in the, in the American Muslim identity where it's still fluid enough that you know, in two or three generations from now they might be set a little bit more in stone. So we have to, we really have to, to have these strong conversations now to make sure that we emerge on the other end um, with something that's going to be beneficial for my grandchildren. Hmm. Well, uh, on that note, I mean, you know, the, we actually we're talking about uh, I'm, I'm American Muslim identity or vice versa, and right. we actually got a, an email, and this is from Yaya uh, Fanusi, and he asks, why do you use the term American Muslim instead of Muslim American? I have my own take on the difference between the terms, but just wondering if it was deliberate or random. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about our, our own thought process in there, but I'd love to get your take, Shahid, on uh, wh which is the quote-unquote right way of referring to it uh, in your mind, American Muslim or Muslim American? You know, I have gone back and forth, and I understand the logic behind each one. If you say you're a Muslim American, that means that your primary identity is American and Muslim is the modifier. Right. Hmm. If you say you're an American Muslim, it's flipped the other way. But they both have they both have a strategic value depending on, the, on your audience. You know, I I want my fellow Americans to know that I'm an American. This is the only country I, I have a loyalty to. It's a country that I served and took an oath to defend. Um, and 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 I have no problem with that, with my Muslimness, you know, being attached to that. Um, when when I use the words when I use the word American Muslim, I mean, allow me to be a little elitist for a second. And, and I, I mean this with all due respect to like Muslims around the world. I think there's something about American Islam that is working. 
when we look at other places in the world, when we look at the turmoil that's happening, when we look at the inability of Muslims around the world to live safely in pluralist societies, when we look at you know, the turbulence that's happening, when we look at the relationship between Muslims and their neighbors in places like Europe, there's something here that's working. There's something about the American Muslim identity that, that, that actually has stability. And I don't think, I don't want to be ashamed of that. I actually want to, to look at the world and say, my Muslim brothers and sisters around the world, there's something here that works. And it's a combination of our values and our attitudes. And I think you can learn from it. So, so sometimes when I'm overseas, I use the term American Muslim. When I'm here I, I, with American audiences, I tend to use Muslim American because it's, it, it falls in line with the other types of America, the hyphenated Americans, right? Um, um, but to be honest, increasingly, um, I, I, I want to kind of separate the two because I'm American full stop and I'm Muslim full stop. And depending on the context, I'll use one or the other. Um, right. Right. So, yeah. Uh, you can't really go wrong with any of them, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's remarkable how American Muslims sort of just sort of caught on because that just you know in terms of usage, I find that to be more commonly used. Um, however, I, I I always sort of you know struggled with it as well, not because so much you know what comes first, but rather I felt that from a strategic point of view, the term Muslim American. Like you said, uh, or you alluded to, that um, it fits more in with the narrative of hyphenated Americans, right? Yeah. Whether you're Jewish American, uh, Black American, Japanese American, and so on. Right. Right. Uh, and so that's what I, I, I just felt that it felt, fit more along those lines. Uh, but I think someone, what, what someone else uh, told me, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I certainly see the merit in this, is that perhaps unlike those other hyphenated American identities, what is interesting about the Muslim community in America, uh, and not just interesting, but unique, perhaps even, is that, you know, we are a, uh, we are a microcosm of the world, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. comprise so many various ethnicities and, and, and languages and cultures. Uh, so unlike, say, Jewish American, which is still a ethnic identity, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or whether it's Black American or Japanese American, where w when you use the term uh, Muslim American, uh, you know, because we comprise so many different uh, cultural and national identities that we, you know, uh, and, and certainly the Black American community, Black American Muslim community, right? We can't. Right. Right. So well, we're it, it, based yeah. community. I mean, that's what we are. We're a values-based community. Right. And I think that also speaks sort of to, to, to the point you raise about, you know, and again, you know, at the risk of sounding elitist, you know, you don't even have to go venture as far as even the Muslim world. Even if you look at Muslims as minorities in the West, I would argue um, a, 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 that the American Muslim community is far more um, – I don't like the word assimilated, but integrated into society. Uh, and that has a large I, – and I, I, and I recognize also the fact that it had a lot to do with the fact that – of the composition or the um, demographics of the people who did immigrate to the United States, right? People like your parents and my parents and Zucky's parents being you know, either uh, you know, highly educated or came here and got highly educated uh, and socially mobile and, and, and so on. So I, I certainly recognize that. Well, we, we also had a um... – you know, there's, there's two factors that I think really helped our development as communities in America. One was that um, we're, we were not ghettoized. I yeah. mean, we, we were geographically dispersed all over the country, um, given, of course, that a lot of people went to different universities. I mean, you'll find, you know, the oldest Muslim cemetery in America is in Ross, North Dakota, you know, of all places, right? Right. Um, we went everywhere. And we do have a diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity. We've got CEOs and we have cab drivers, right? We've yeah. got we've got the whole run, right. but 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 there's no one dominant group, either socioeconomically or ethnically or whatever. But there's no one dominant group. And the, when I see problems, um, it's easy for Muslims in Germany to rally around Turkish identity. It's easy for Muslims in France to rally around Algerian identity. It it's convenient and it's it's human. It's it's natural, but it also forestalls a solution to the problem. And we were never we were never given that 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 road out.
Right. And I think we'd be remiss not to also mention the fact that unique probably to the American Muslim experience uh, or, or, or Islamic uh, history in, in, in America was the fact that we also, you know, post-1965, certainly the immigrate, you know, the immigrant, immigrant influx. But we, we, we came to a land where you already had a uh, an indigenous American Muslim population, and that Absolutely. had its own history and, and its own trajectory, and and they were you know sort of struggling with their own uh, issues as well, and and so that makes a very unique historical uh, experience. Anecdotally, among my friends, I'd say about a quarter of my friends intermarried between cultures. Wow, so right? American and Arab, or yeah. you know Indian and, and 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 Caucasian or whatever. Imagine what this is going to be three, four generations from now. Exactly. You know, so so we, true. The, our my grandkids will tie their heritage to like ten points around the world, and will take pride in all of that. Um, and I think that's a that's an absolutely utterly beautiful thing. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, let's start, let's talk a little bit about sort of the 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 role of of Muslim engagement with the the broader world, the the the, the quote unquote mainstream, in context with what you're talking about, because uh, and this is the uh, shot. This is the conversation we were having uh, off mic, right? I I feel like obviously for for as much of a, a historical juncture point nine eleven is, I think uh, for the world at large, I think there's also we can we can point to that as a moment where to a large extent from that point on. Uh, certain, certainly Muslims in America started to take a greater, greater ownership in their own narrative. And, our, and, our narrative was in danger of being stolen from us. And I think the yeah. people that, that reacted after 9-11 basically said, I can accept the new narrative that's being defined by both the, the extremists and terrorists and the people that are afraid of Muslims, or I can capture my own identity and project it out and push back against both of them. And, 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 and Muslim, you know, think of it this way. The day after 9-11, we had 1,200 mosques in this country. Ten years later, we had doubled the number of mosques in this country. And it wasn't because of immigration and it wasn't because of conversion. It was because Muslims decided as a group to take a stand to protect their identity. And, and 9-11 galvanized that. I mean, it was a horrible circumstance for which that to happen, but, you know, here we are now, you know, we now 10 years after 9-11 have, or we have Muslim members of Congress. We have prominent Muslims in the media. We are, are by every single metric, happier, more educated, more wealthy, more integrated. I mean, there's not a single metric that is down in the last, you know, last 14 years since 9-11. Um, that speaks to both the resiliency of American Muslim communities and the ability of our American neighbors to accept us for who we are. Well, and, but, and yeah, go ahead, Pervis. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know where you were going to go, Zaki. I, I, I just, I mean, you know, when, when you were talking about metrics, like, the, like, the, the, you know, I think it would be again remiss not to recognize the fact that although the, all, all those are true, the metric that we do see on the rise also in those 14 years since 9/11 is just the rise of anti-Muslim sentiment in America, because I think we would certainly um, all recognize the fact that things are worse in regards to general attitudes that Americans have about Islam and Muslims than they were in the days following or even the year after 9-11. I, I completely agree, and I, mean, I, I certainly don't mean to minimize that. I mean, I don't think those of us in the years after 9-11 who thought the worst is over right. realized that it would get increasingly worse and increasingly worse you know for 10 years after 9 11 we didn't have mosques being protested yeah 10 years after right so right. what what's happening in the popular discourse to make this happen now obviously a lot of this has to do with the fact that we spent much of the last 10 years in military conflict with, with muslim peoples around the world which That's right. which i mean if, if, if i may be permitted to use the word radicalized <laughs> some of our american neighbors um and 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 Obviously, there's a there's a parallel between the reality of our existence in terms of our legal existence and our financial existence and whatnot, and you know the sentiment that is online, which is through the roof, um, and which is now starting to leak into the real world, right? So the question is, okay, what now we have these these two things that are coexisting, which one is going to prevail? So that's why we're we're at a very interesting point in history. And uh, you know, ten years from now, we're going to look back and look at this time and place, 
as as the time where one of those prevailed. That's uh, that's so true. When you say through the roof, it's like yeah, it's like the comment section on uh, you know of the internet just went mainstream. You know, it, yeah. and, and now people can say those <laughs> ugly and vile things, except yeah. on you know Fox News or even CNN. Or, you know, I've, I've had to have lots of difficult conversations with my children, um, and, and 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 you know my my I, 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 my proudest moment as a father. My 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 kids. Um, there was this event in Austin, Texas, where they had this Capitol Day, and, um, yeah. and there was a small. After ten years of no one even noticing it, there were protesters there, and one woman grabbed the mic, and you had uh, Assembly Member Molly White say she was going to meet with Muslims. I saw and, that. And my son uh, emailed me an article. He's thirteen, and uh, he emailed me a, a letter he had written to Molly White. And and I was so scared to even like read the email because I thought, oh my god, you know, this is going to be a window into my child's emerging Muslim identity. The pride that he had in who he was, and and it was it was not a pride like you are, I am a Muslim and you're a different person and you know I'm better than you or I'm stronger than you. It was a pride that you have nothing to fear from me. I will make this country a better place. I will make your life a better place. You just wait and see. And for a 13 year old to have that kind of wisdom about their identity, it just brought tears to my eyes. And, and I, I wish that for every Muslim child in this country to know that you have a heritage that is meaningful, that is beneficial. You have people around you that are talented, that, that are, are smart and are, are connected. And we will prevail because most Americans are good people and they recognize decent decency when they see it. And all we need to do is project our decency to the world and we will have the entire world on our side. Well, and, and just to, you know, just, just to, I, I would offer a, a, a ray of hope here that, that while we've absolutely seen an increase in, you know, as, as we've referred to it or has been referred to, you know, the Islamophobia network, you know, the, there is much more awareness that, it's not okay. Number one, I think, for example, when we're talking about, you know, people like Pamela Geller, um, for, for one thing I would offer, actually, when it comes to people like Pamela Geller, is that when, when you look at, you know, when you look at somebody like her influence, and if you filter out of the sample Muslims and Fox News viewers, most people don't even know who she is. True. And, and when they are presented with her views unvarnished, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, they... Are, she is dismissed as a crank. Yeah. Even the uh, that are I think as did happen, right? I mean, in, in the wake of the, uh, in, you know, like the Garland, uh, what happened in Garland uh, last week, she went on a media uh, tour, and you know, those those appearances didn't, didn't go so well. No, I, I, even people who defend her, right, say that they don't like her. <laughs> you know, uh, so so I, I want to take a step back. I. So one of the things that I, you know, I was I was at the State Department for three years, and my job at the State Department was digital diplomacy to young Muslims around the world, huh. and and it involved uh, social media training, entrepreneurship training, and just simple outreach to these young groups of Muslims. So I had the pleasure and opportunity to meet with m- young Muslim leaders in 30 different countries around the world, and there wasn't a single one of these countries where this group of people wasn't looking to the events in America as, as something that was going to impact them at some point in their lives. Yeah. Because again, yeah. you're talking about a generation of young people that's growing up on the internet. And America and American Muslims have an oversized you know, presence on that. Um, so they were acutely aware of everything that was happening, but they were also acutely aware of some of the amazing things that were happening among American Muslims. And, and, and they are looking to voices here for leadership. They're looking to partner. They're looking to cooperate. Um, and, and, and it's, it's a heady responsibility. It really is. There's some amazing people out there, amazing young leaders who are being shaped by the things that we're doing. Because they're not finding it in their local communities. You know, the Muslims that I met in Ghana or the Muslims that, you know, I was dealing with in, in Belgium or in, you know, some of these other places. They're, they're not finding this, these, these ideas in their communities. They're finding it from the online spaces and they're finding it from, you know, their counterparts, um, frankly, in America more than anyone else. And um, that's why I want to encourage more people to get out there and more people to project themselves and, and be 
be outrageous and ostentatious and proud and, and confident and and push the envelope. Because people are depending on you. There are 500 million Muslim youth around the world between the ages of 18 and 25, right? That's a huge audience, mm-hmm. you know? And, 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 and they're, they're, they're consume, rabid consumers of content online. Well, and, and I mean, let's, let's talk about that. In, in terms of, uh, the, you know, you, you've alluded to that to some extent. Uh, how has the online space in in your opinion, and certainly as somebody who has ha- had a, a key role front and center, uh, how has the online space for Muslims evolved from the time alt Muslim started to I mean you know let's sort of from alt Muslim to to, to Hakathon, uh chart that trajectory. What what are the what are some of the big changes you've seen? Um, some of the big changes I've seen are this. Um, I, I I'm seeing a lot more boldness among young Muslim voices around the world to project themselves. People are not afraid anymore of authority. People are not afraid to let their opinion be known. Um, and it's a, it's a complicated environment. Not everybody agrees with each other, and that's fine. Um, we didn't see that back in the early days. Back in the early days, even in the early days of alt-Muslim, we were all still trying to tow a line, right? Um, there are no more lines to tow anymore. Um, and it's because everybody is claiming their part of this thing we call Muslim identity and and claiming it as our own and and the good thing is that it's just expanding the envelope of what that means. But the bad thing is that there's just a lot of chaos out there. Um, I am continually frustrated that there are not more initiatives that are in this environment. I was doing some focus groups in um, the Middle East in terms of consumption patterns of young Muslims online. And the vast majority of content they consume is Western content. It's not content either you know, in their language or specifically catering to them as young Muslims. And, and, and I think that's a lost opportunity, you know, um, because you have this thirst for knowledge, because you have this thirst for identity, and then, you know, count the number of, of major websites that like, you know, reach out to these audiences and, and they're few and far between, or they come and they go, you know, very quickly. Um, that's something that has to be corrected. We have to take this great amount of talent and energy and focus it so that we've got some institutions, you know, your podcast is up to 20 podcasts. That's awesome. I want it to go to hundred podcasts. I want there to be a hundred podcasts too. <laughs> like your podcast, right? You know, um, it, it, the fact that there's just a handful of notable ones is sad, frankly. Um, and, and, and just, it needs to be corrected. You know, you, you, well, you talk about establishing institutions and I think you, one one institution that I think of as, is very much a part of my life, and I would assume a lot of other people is Zabiha dot com, and I think this is this is a great way to to talk about how you can take an idea, implement it, and even though it's it's targeted towards a fairly quote unquote niche audience, it can achieve mass penetration. I mean, let, let's let's talk about Zabiha dot com. What was the origin of that, and and uh, did you ever foresee it becoming uh, uh, what it is now? Oh, I had no idea. I mean, in 1998, I was working at a startup in Silicon Valley. And as you know, there are a lot of Muslim engineers that work in Silicon Valley. And they work late hours and they want to go eat. I literally put up a simple web page that had the halal eateries that I had known about in the area in Silicon Valley. And I noticed it started to get a lot more traffic. And it, it got to the point where by, you know, within six months, I said, you know, something there's even though there are not a whole lot of halal restaurants around, I think I need to kind of capture this. So I created Zabeda.com in 1998. At the time, I could find no more than 200 restaurants around the country that openly served halal food. Hmm. Um, but what it, what it turned out to be was something much bigger than just simply, I need to go eat. The first thing <laughs> that it was, it was the beginning of a revolution in terms of uh, the, the halal marketplace as we know it. Um, we, we, Zabia.com contributed to a tipping point where there was now a market to be served. And, 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 and we went from 200 restaurants in 1998 to eight to 9,000 restaurants today in America alone. Now wow. there was a point where I wanted to create a, 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 a kosher version of Zabia.com. Um, I, I actually have the domain koshr.com. I was going to actually do it there. Um, the uh-huh. reason I didn't actually follow through with it is because there's only there's only 1,500 kosher restaurants in America in comparison to the 9,000 halal restaurants that are in America. So for simple market, 
dynamics, I didn't pursue it. But it shows you how dynamic that was. And it's bigger than just, oh, we have a big community that eats a lot. Food is an amazing cultural medium. And what you've had in the last 10 years is an immense amount of curiosity about Muslim Islam. And hmm. for the average person, the easiest way to dive into that world is to dive into their food. And I, and I, I believe, and I, I, I know this is anecdotal because I'm just judging this on reviews and input I've got from people, but there are quite a few non-Muslims that use Zabiyah.com because they're curious about this universe that is called Islam and these people hmm. called Muslims. And, yeah. and by, by immersing themselves in this, something so intimate as the eating experience that they can actually understand us more. And so there's actually like a, a much deeper philosophical kind of outgrowth of this that I never would have imagined in the beginning when literally all I just want to do is find some place to eat. Right. Well, it's all it takes sometimes is just the, you know, the, that, that initial stirrings of an idea and the next yeah. thing you know. You know, you, you, you know that, the, uh, that the, uh, the Muslim haters have lost their argument when the people that go to protest the Park 51 Center in Manhattan finish their protest and then line up at the halal carts to eat lunch. Like, <laughs> you have lost the, you've not just lost the battle, you've lost the war. So if nothing else, we can get people through their stomachs. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we, That's we, not a threat, just to be clear. Okay. Everybody was... <laughs> I am proud, by the way, I'm proud to be um, helping the, the new um, restaurant chain, the Halal Guys expand uh -huh. across America. They're planning to put 2,000 restaurants across America. The franchiser that grew five guys to 2,000 restaurants cleared uh -huh. his plate to join the Halal Guys team to grow them to 2,000 restaurants across America. Wow. And that is only possible because we've created an environment where people understand that this is part of the culinary landscape. That, that we actually have a contribution that is every bit as important as Chinese food, Italian food, bagels, whatever you have it. It's our contribution, and it's something that benefits everybody. And because of that, we can have a chain of 2,000 restaurants called the Halal Guys in this environment grow and thrive and prosper. You're going to start seeing some of the first franchises opening up in your areas toward the end of the year, and I hope you like it. Well, I, I think the ultimate example of uh, interfaith outreach will be once we can have the five halal guys. That's kind of <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, no. But no. true but, appropriation uh, of a uh, yeah. Well, and, and and Shai, I mean, I mean, so, so you you talk about the halal guys, and obviously you you've got uh, involvement in so many different uh, ventures that are coming up. Uh, you know, I, I'd love for you to, you know, as we sort of uh, wind our time down, I'd love for you to uh, share some of the other projects that you have coming up that we should be keeping an eye out for. Oh, absolutely. So, so my latest endeavor. Um, so, so let me back up a little bit. So when I left the State Department, I left because I was going to embark on a new startup called Launch Posse. Now, Launch Posse is unique in that it's, it's my first recent venture that isn't targeting specifically the Muslim community. It's, it's, it's targeting um, people writ large. But I'd like to think, when I tell the story of this as I launch, and we'll be launching by the summer, um, that it is powered by my Islamic values and it's powered from a, from a place of by Muslims for everybody that I, that I believe there is a value system I have that says that we cannot accept an economic underclass in this world, that everybody has a right to employment, to create their own businesses, to be self-sufficient and, and to not leave those people behind. So I've, I've shifted, I've pivoted a little bit in the way I do it, but the core ethos is still there. Now, um, because I am like, a uh, a little bit of attention deficit disorder and I, I tend to <laughs> get bored with like if, if having Zabia.com and all this other stuff isn't enough. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've obviously embarked on this, this, this uh, venture called Affinis, which I've, I've co-founded with an old colleague of mine from the white house who uh, I used to work with, who we both worked very deeply in Muslim communities and, and felt that we needed to do something to kind of stimulate entrepreneurship within Muslim communities. So the whole Affinis project is based on three things. One is based on these hackathons, like the hackathon that happened in Abu Dhabi, um, <laughs> that, that go to Muslim communities around the world. We're doing one in Kenya in July. We're doing one in Australia in June with Australian Muslim communities. And the whole point of that is to stimulate real functioning ideas out of Muslim communities to solve both their problems and larger problems. And, and I, I am, I'm 
emphasizing for-profit businesses, even though we'll do both, but I'm emphasizing for-profit businesses because I want to break out of this cycle of dependency with donors and grants and things like that. I believe you can create businesses that have a significant social impact. The second part of that, of, of that is Affinis Labs, which is the incubator that we started here in Northern Virginia, which specifically incubates businesses that have a positive social impact in Muslim communities. So we have a cohort of about eight companies in there. Some of the companies include uh, LaunchGood, which is, um, which is a crowdfunding platform for Muslim entrepreneur, uh, charitable projects. Um, Ishker, which is a kind of Muslim matchmaking site and app. Um, there's another one called Aquabean, which is like a Muslim lifestyle products company. We're bringing on some others as well, but all of these have in common that they're going after the same market and it's primarily kind of Gen X millennial Muslims uh, who are trying to live their lifestyle in, in, in an open way and in a way that's consistent with their surroundings, um, but also with a, with, a, with a very heavy social impact and positive social impact on communities. Um, the third leg of that stool is a, a venture fund. We're raising a $5 million venture fund to stimulate these ideas, some of them which come from the hackathons, and then we'll be raising a larger one toward the end of the year, uh, probably a $25 million fund, um, to, to invest in these companies as they kind of come of age and mature and they're big enough to take larger sums of money. Um, what I'm hoping this will do is that over the years we'll spin out enough companies that start to create an ecosystem of Muslim entrepreneurial talent that is seeking to solve problems in the Muslim communities in a market-driven way and, and creating a space for pride, creating a space for innovation, creating a space for excitement. You know, I want young people to grow up and think, I want to be a part of that ecosystem. Um, the great thing is, unlike when I was going into Silicon Valley and I knew very few Muslims in the space, if you now are growing up as a Muslim in this country, you're two degrees away from anyone who's like an expert or top of their field in whatever field there is. So that's you've so got true. opportunities that are, you know, we have a small network, but it's a network that's easily managed, right? Like I'm, you're, I'm literally, I think every young person coming out of college is, is two or three degrees away from like someone at the top of the career they want to go into. And, and I want to, I want to help stimulate that with this ecosystem of businesses. Which brings us to the real reason we have you on the show, which is the diffuse congruence uh, proposal that you'll be. Uh, <laughs> Send it to Shahid at AffinisCable.com, and I'll happily consider it. <laughs> it's our, our evil plan is is now yeah stands bare. Well, and and uh, that that's a, a good place to to wind things down. But but uh, Shahid, I mean, I know you're 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 very easy to find online. But but where can people look if they want to seek you out? You know, very simple. I'm at Shahed on Twitter. Um, I'm at Facebook.com slash Amanullah. Um, you can go to Shahed.com and you'll see links to all my stuff there. Um, but uh, so but that's, pretty... that's proof enough of how much of an early adopter you were. Yes, exactly. <laughs> very <laughs> have their first name as a domain name. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I'm, you know, and I, I, I say this with all honesty. I mean, you know, I do not believe that uh, people who achieve things uh, should uh, hold themselves up in an ivory tower. I want to make myself available to anyone who needs mentorship with a business, who needs uh, advice on um, on whatever career they're going into, who needs you know wants to, to to get into government or wants to get into entrepreneurship or wants to get into the media or whatever. I I, I remain open to whoever needs that help. Um, I I will give it give it back until I die. Wow. Well, uh, Shahid, again, thank you so much for, for coming on with us. It was definitely a very illuminating uh, hour. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to, uh, again, and we say this to all our guests, we're looking forward to you rejoining us some point down the line, and we can, we can reconvene and pick up where we left off. Absolutely. It was my pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to be a, a participant, not just a listener. Awesome. Well, uh, we will talk to you soon then. Great. Take care. Mm-hmm. And uh, Pervez, with that, uh, before we wrap things up, I wanted to share uh, another review that we have left for us uh, by Mr. Striving, and this is on uh, our iTunes uh, storefront. And Mr. Striving says, uh, why do we listen to podcasts? Because we love the idea of tapping into the world in an unfiltered way and learning from stories of people who may be half a globe away or just next door, but who we might not engage or listen to because the lines of communication are usually closed or at the most quite narrow. This show enables us to do what we love with our podcast listening, to hear people's journeys, backgrounds, and perspectives. This is pretty good, Professor. What do you think? Yeah, seriously. Uh, uh, what was it? Is it Mr. Shriver? What was the name again? Mr. Striving. 
Mr. Striving. There you go. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, he, 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 he continues. Hold on. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Per- Pervez and Zucky do a pretty good job allowing people to tell their stories uninterrupted. So. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, a pretty good job. I lost him a little bit there. All right. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, but he goes on. One could criticize that the line. Okay. Again. That's fine. <laughs> That the lineup of guests might not fully reflect the depth and diversity of the Muslim American experience. One gets the sense that many of the guests have similar spiritual outlooks and intellectual influences. But one podcast airing only monthly can't do that. Seriously, Mr. Striving, come on. Give give us some slack here. Uh, If anything, it shows the need for more podcasts and more media presence just like this effort. Well, I definitely agree with that. All said, very good podcast here with thoughtful, intriguing conversations. Highly recommended. So thank you so much, Mr. Striving. We will certainly uh, make uh, make a better effort to, 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 I don't know, Pervez, do we interrupt people? No, you know, but I I think, you know, I I think that uh, he... uh, or he or she, I guess in this. Well, age, it is. It is Mister. I know, but in this internet age, you never know. But That's um, a good point. right, the anonymity of the internet. But uh, yeah, yeah, hey. uh, is that, yeah. But I think there is a good point that is made, which is that, uh, or or one that we haven't really necessarily addressed per se. Uh, uh, is that uh, yeah? I mean, like the the lineup of guests that we have had on and that we will continue to have on. Uh, you know, there's no there's no sort of magic in terms of. Like or, or 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 even I would say like a method to the madness in terms of who we reach out to. It's just a matter of who. One, we kind of like just scour our own. Like, okay, who do you know? Who do I know? And then through those contacts, either you know, like someone like Shahid, for example, who it's like one degree of separation. I mean, you you and I directly reached out to, but you know, in the case of say someone like I don't know Asif Manvi or you know I, I can't think or Farhan Tahir. Well, no, Farhan Tahir would be also. But but say I think a case in point. Asif Manvi, where, you know, we through, you know, the, uh, uh, through a contact that we, you, you and I had reached out to, and then they made, the, they helped facilitate all of that happening. So um, it's not by design in terms of having guests on who all fit within a particular mold per se. And even then, even that I would maybe push back on. I don't think that's necessarily the case that everyone sort of does, uh, Come from right. I mean, from a from a particular, say, spiritual or ideological. I think were the words he you you know spiritual outlook. Yeah. Um, and and that's also to say that uh, you know we don't by design exclude people that uh, you know like again may not uh, you know. Yeah. The, well, it's any any sort of homogeneity is uh, certainly not, there you go. not by design. It's it, and, and not uh, an intent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but obviously that's that's certainly something that we're always in in the market to, uh, you know, to soldier on through and and uh, and and I think it's worth pointing out that our goal is very much to increase the the the. I was going to say increase the intensity. That's not right. Increase the frequency of the yeah. well, and the intensity. We're going to be faster, more intense. We're going to be like <laughs> when he gives direction to his actors. Uh, we we do want to increase the frequency of the show, and I think I think uh, some of uh, that perceived homogeneity, which again I that's something I might push back against, but I think that by virtue of increasing our output, that would sort of uh, start to go away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we we would love to we, we would love to be able to bring the show maybe you know twice a month or something, and um, we'll we'll see if certain things fall into place. We might be moving in that direction. We shall see. So that is a cliffhanger, if you will. Uh, <laughs> when will we be back? Either next month or in two weeks. We'll see. You have to add us to your bookmark queue, and uh, you know set up your alerts so that you know. Um, but with that, let's uh, wind things down. Pervez, where can people find you online? I am uh, diffu- uh, I am um, on Twitter uh, the, uh, at the new Mud Hub. Uh, of course, you can go to our Facebook page. Uh, you, should probably, you, you should probably spell the new Mud Hub because. Well, you know, I've actually had people uh, who've tagged me, right? Um, you know, in terms of recognizing this podcast. So uh, yeah. anyway, it, it is it is uh, uh, the new N E N E W, and then Mud Hub is M A D H H A B. And where can people find you on Twitter? I know you're a. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm at Zaki's Corner. That's the A-K-I-S Corner. I'm also at the Huffington Post, uh, where my movie reviews go up regularly, as does this show, as does my other show, uh, the Movie Film Podcast. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. That's Diffused Congruence. Uh, 
or sorry, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. And we're also at, at, uh, our, our email address is diffuse congruence at gmail.com. And we always want to hear what you have to say. So, uh, please do let us know how we're doing. Hit up a star, uh, hit up, uh, uh, iTunes, give us a star rating also on Stitcher radio. And, uh, we will look forward to catching you next time. On behalf of my colleague, Pervez Ahmed, this is Zaki Hassan, and this has been Diffuse Congruence. We'll see you next time. <laughs>